So now what we need to do is we need to create actually the Sprint configuration file. So back here in WebXML, we said Sprint could find it at this location. So we need to go into Web and Flib and create a folder called Context. And then inside of this folder, we need to create an XML file. And it's called application context dot XML. And at the top of it, you're gonna we're gonna have our standard schema definitions. This is just spring standards. You can find it in again, this is the the the, the baseline frame or template type code. You really don't think about it. And as you implement different parts of Spring, there'll be more schemas that you'll want to use. But for our basic starting application, this will get us by. All right, then the first thing, if you're familiar with Spring, this will be a little bit new in versions. Well, I guess it's been around since 2.5. Uh, oops. A setting that allows annotation configuration. And now another setting that tells Spring how to find uh, internationalization resource files. So this will be used, we'll use this in our JSP, or you would normally use this in your JSP later on. I guess you could use it in any Java class that you wanted to. Then we're going to configure what's called a, a view resolver. And this is part of the MVC framework. And we're going to be using a JSP view resolver. So basically, we'll see it later on, but the framework's going to look in that directory for files that end with a JSP extension. And this, this view resolver is set up to work with JSPs. Uh, there's other built-in view resolvers, probably like a Velocity one, maybe. Uh, maybe a PDF one and off the top of my head, I don't remember. But the way the framework works is it's not tied to JSP as the view technology, although that's what we'll be doing is JSP. And then a default exception handler. So if there's any exceptions that occur in the MVC framework, it has a default error view, and it will look for a JSP up here called DEF error, and then if it gets a, you know, it's the default exception handler, and then if the exception that is that bubbles up through the framework is of this type, it'll look for a JSP called app error. You can configure this, you know, with whatever, catching whichever different exceptions that you feel like, pointing at different, um, different views. Uh, in our case, these will be JSPs. And actually, we probably won't even implement them. All right, so that's all we need for the application context XML. The next file we need to do is the portlet specific configuration file. Now, that file is just going to go inside a web and flib. And the Spring MVC uses a convention on how it finds these, these the configuration file for a specific portlet. And that is that the file name has to match exactly the, the, the portlet name in the portlet XML. So it needs to match exactly that entry right there. So I'll just copy this. And now we'll create another XML file. And the convention is portlet name dash portlet dot XML. And similar to the application context, we're going to have a, some default schema configuration, XML configuration. And again, with the context annotation, um, this entry here allows us not to have to control this one right here. We do not have to enter any 
or configure any controller information. And controllers are basically uh, be analogous to a struts action, but it, it's where the uh, the main handoff point from the Spring framework to your code is. In uh, Spring, they're referred to as controllers. And with this configuration setting right here, we don't actually need to configure any controllers in this configuration file. We're able to use annotations in our controller classes, and the framework will automatically find them. And actually, our controllers do not have to extend any framework-specific classes or implement any framework-specific uh, interfaces. They're just normal POJOs that have been decorated with annotations, so you can, you know, so some framework code does creep into the class, but it's a, a very nice uh, way where, you know, the, the class isn't tied so much to the framework itself. Um, next thing is a handler mapping. So we have a handler mapping that works with annotations. And another exception handler. This one really extends the exception handler that we created in the other, in the, the main application context. We don't r need it so much other than the one we've de declared here is uh, abstract. And it looks like I took off the abstract off of the uh, abstract setting. I think. Yeah. So actually, we, we really don't need this, but I'm going to leave it just because I have the example running. All right, so that's the basic setup. Now we're ready to get into actually code our uh, our own business logic or, or the the functionality that we need in the portlet. So the first thing I'm going to do is create the controller class, and so we need to create a controller package. Uh, and I forgot to mention back here in the this this class right here that scanner that looks for the annotated classes that define themselves as controllers it's going to look in that package right there so I, I did have to name it that just to to match the configuration that I set up um, all right so we got a package now let's go ahead and create a class and I will call this our first controller And notice we, we're not extending any framework class or implementing any framework interface. It's, you're, you're completely free to do what we want. Uh, but the way Spring is going to recognize this as a controller is by the controller annotation. So just by decorating this class with that annotation, S Spring is going to recognize this as a controller. All right, the next thing we want to do is with that default handler mapping that, that I want to get too far into the details of that but we set up what mode this controller is going to handle so in portlets there's going to be view edit config modes we're going to create this one so that it handles view mode and all we have to do is decorate it with that annotation with that value and now it's going to handle view modes for us All right. And a part of the booty with the, these uh, Spring MVC annotated controllers is we can call methods whatever we want. We don't have to implement any interface, and it, it's almost like magic how it works. Um, so our, our first method that we'll put into the controller, we're just going to call it show index, and it's going to return a string. And that string is actually the name of the view that the that Spring MVC is going to try and find, and view is really just the JSP in that directory we had configured. So if I just return the string index, Spring MVC will try, or will will try. It's going to go look in that JSP directory that we configured for a file called index.jsp. Now again, we have like we did with the uh, up here with the class itself, we have to decorate the method with an annotation. And all we have to do 
is use this request mapping annotation. And now Spring will say, okay, if I'm in view mode and I come into this and I'm in the render phase, it's going to look for the most specific request mapping that it can find. Because we're not putting any parameters onto this annotation, this will become the default view for the view mode. Um, so when you first come into the portlet, this is going to run. So let's just create our JSP. If we come over here, if you remember back in our application context, we said JSPs would be found under WebIMP JSP directory. So we'll create a JSP directory. And in this JSP directory, we'll create an index.jsp. And I'm just going to cut and paste some header JSP stuff, with some tag lib imports, and that portlet define objects tag. And I'll just put in here first spring portlet. And believe it or not, with what we have just done, this portlet should run. If I publish this out right now, you should have a working example of a Spring MVC portlet. So let's give it a shot. And I'm running in debug mode, which I've gotten in the habit of lately. I'll just go into de debug mode. And we'll publish it to the server. <laughs> 